All right, let's get started. It's 12.05. Uh, so quick announcements. Uh, uh, there are no lectures as I had indicated in the syllabus early on. Uh, there are no lectures next week uh, for the class, but it will be on like Monday and Wednesday, but in the lecture, make the lecture on Friday. Uh, it is uh, going to be only one, but like, so instead of having three hours of lecture time, we'll have 75 minutes of lecture time. Uh, and we have designed the course in a way that I'm able to kind of cover that material and not like have you to like do like a three hour makeup lecture. So it's going to be one makeup lecture. However, the homework that is required for you to be uh, done Friday, uh, next Friday, we'll cover the material by today. So technically, you can solve that uh, homework problem without having to kind of wait until next week. However, there, if there are questions, I can address them a little bit uh, next makeup lecture on Friday. The makeup lecture will be on in this room itself. So we'll not, uh, this room will be the location. Uh, homework is due on Friday. And then Philippe will have office hours this Friday if you have questions. And the next Friday also, like if you have questions for homework, okay? So hopefully you'll have enough material. And again, this is not a long homework. Uh, I know you have other homeworks also due next week. So start early. Uh, you will not take a lot of time. The first question, I already got a couple of emails. Some of you have already started it and it will not take you long. Like you can finish this homework. Uh, you know, in a couple of like, you know, uh, each column will take two to, two to three hours each at max. Okay. Uh, any questions for homework or makeup lecture? Yes. <laughs> so oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I think it should be 16. Thanks, Felipe. I've forgotten how to do additions. <laughs> All right. So it's uh, 14 and 16. Uh, and then, you know, makeup lectures on, on Friday. Any questions about the makeup lecture? Anything about the homework? Any questions? All good? Okay, so we'll make sure you have enough help. Unfortunately, given the, so I'm again flying out on the 19th for another conference. So I'll unfortunately not have the time to kind of have a, like an in-person office hour, but don't hesitate to email me. I'll respond. I'll make sure to respond if you have any questions on the homework or anything else in general, okay? So uh, please just like, do make sure you use the office hours by Felipe. And do not hesitate to email me if you have any questions. I'll make sure I respond. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So, you can, yeah, that's, really, that's a good idea. Uh, we anyway record it. And so I'll just also send out a link for the Zoom. So, if some of you want to attend through Zoom, uh, that's also absolutely fine. Not a problem at all. Of course. Yeah. I, I, anyway, this is a Zoom meeting. So, it's easy. Anything else? Uh, uh, so Felipe, you could just email them. I forget your <laughs> number all the time. So Felipe will email and send send out reminders on the office hour. <laughs> Anything else? All good. All right. Okay. So let's continue. I, I want to make sure we cover all the important points uh, today. So remember that we are focusing. We were uh, started this part three by talking about the draft courses, and we started thinking about higher order number flows. We said potential flow cannot solve. I gave you a draft force. So we discuss discuss an outer region and an inner region. In the inner region, remember that we discussed these boundary layer equations. Boundary layer equations. So again, remember that these these come from Navier-Stokes equation, right? Using scaling analysis, that delta by L is much much smaller than one. This is how we had gotten to these equations. Uh, and this u du by dx, capital U du by dx, this comes from outer solution. So in the last class, we said well. Uh, We'll try to make the life easy by basically focusing on a flat flow geometry where the outer solution has a velocity to be constant, constant equal to u naught. So we dropped off that term, right? For flat plate, this term was equal to zero for flat plate because outside velocity was simply u naught. There was no variation in the velocity. Uh, and then we used similarity and stream function to solve it. We also spent a fair bit of time trying to do scaling analysis. I want to emphasize that all of these relationships here, here, and this can come through scaling analysis or order of magnitude analysis. It is the pre-factors for which you need the uh, full solution, okay? Uh, in, in this course and in general, like beyond this course, whenever you see systems, please don't forget scaling analysis. You can always figure out those constants by solving the equation. But if you can do the scaling analysis correctly, 
I think this will go a long way, you know, whenever you run into any problem related to transport in your research. I also want to emphasize one thing is that remember that these scaling analysis are not random. These are not like we are uh, kind of finding these numbers using some sort of a dimensional group. We are actually using conservation equations, right? So we use scaling analysis on conservation equations and boundary conditions to come to these values. So remember how kind of like this process that an advanced transport phenomena understanding is determining what are the governing equations and then applying scaling analysis on those governing equations to find an answer. Okay, so that there are two pieces to that. Okay, so this was what we did. Uh, we I forgot to do the poll last time, so let's quickly do the polls right away. So we you have the formulas for tau wall, uh, FD, and Gra coefficient. So let's do the poll now. So do you think drag forces increases with length? Does the drag force increase with length? Uh, you have the formula there. If you want to take a look or if you want to physically argue, please feel free to do that either. And let's have you all participate. I'll just give another 30 seconds to participate. All right, maybe a couple more responses are still kind of not there. Please make sure to respond. Maybe five more seconds. One, okay, all right, I'll close the poll now. All right, so most of you have it right. It is actually the drag force does increase with length. And why? Because it's FD, okay? So remember it's FD. The drag force is the force. It's not talking about the stress. So when you have the length being higher, you obviously increase the, uh, there's a small typo here. There's a square root, just before I forget. There's a square root here. But uh, the, the higher the L, the higher the drag force. Know that if I was to ask you a wall stress, right? That whether the wall stress increases with X or not, the wall stress actually decreases with X, right? Because wall stress is inversely proportional, but the drag force is multiplied with the area. So it does increase with length. Okay, just want to clarify that. Now let's do another, another quick question. What do you think about drag coefficient? Does the drag coefficient increase with length? All right, it seems like all of you have responded. If some of you haven't, please make sure to get your answers in. Uh, all right, perfect. Let me close the poll now. So, correct. Uh, so, the drag coefficient actually decreases with, inc with increase in length because uh, it's inversely proportional to the length. This is all math. Why do you think physically drag coefficient should decrease in length? So, so could you really elaborate a little bit more? So, so we are thinking of flat feet, by the way. We are not still going through any other system. Why do you think the, why should I expect a drag coefficient to decrease when I'm increasing the, the length? So I think I think you you are all going in sort of in the right direction. Think of the the way we have defined the drag coefficient. So drag coefficient is saying it's the drag force, right? By divided by the by the inertial drag, right? Purely inertial drag. Rho u not square by two into length times uh, in that bit, right? And we had discussed last time how that if you have only skin drag, if you have only skin drag, it doesn't increase as fast as the inertial drag. Because uh, skin drag is composed of both 
the the contract uh, the secondary component would be that somewhere in the middle where the viscosity is, is uh, half is density is predominantly the length of the structure. So that's the idea is that because this is my definition of drag coefficient. Okay, you can be you can say I am not I don't want this drag coefficient definition. I want something else. Let's say I want to scale the viscous stress, which you can do. You are allowed to do that by viscous stress. Then you will get a different relationship. Because it's the definition is that our drag coefficient is based on inertial stress, and that's why uh, we are kind of getting into this. That's the, sort of the idea. And that kind of also goes back to the discussion we were having towards the end is that for bodies, these are called by the bluff bodies, which have sort of like not a streamlined shape. So, a streamlined body and a bluff body, like a cylinder is a bluff body, where basically you have kind of these sort of uh, a pretty clearly uh, shape which is not streamlined, not a gentle slope. It's a, a high. Uh, high slopes in the geometry, uh, and in these systems, you they have the form drag start to kind of kind of become important because a parallel by a perpendicular is on the order of one, right? Order of one is the bluff body. Bluff body, and if I make it small, is the streamline body. So that's why you kind of want to have the streamline. Kind of shapes to decrease the overall drag. Okay. So that, that's the idea between the between the um, bluff bodies and the streamline bodies. So any questions on sort of the discussion of skin drag, form drag? Uh, some of you had mentioned with when we started this uh, kind of portion about boundary layer separation and something that is something I have not discussed till now. Uh, for those of you interested, I just want to emphasize that boundary layer separation is a part of the form drag. Okay. This takes care of some of the boundary layer separation part goes in that form drag. Unfortunately, in the interest of time, I don't want to kind of go into that. There is a lot of technical details about how that happens, how to predict it. The book does have an example. So if some of you are just interested and curious, there, are, there is some description in the book. But for the purposes of this course, you don't have to worry about it. But just remember what is the difference between skin drag and form drag. Okay, Skin drag is this boundary layer part and the form drag is purely inertia. Okay. Any questions here? All right, so this concludes chapter nine. So chapter nine, we are now over. So now we are going to chapter 10 of Dean and we'll start to combine fluid flow uh, and the heat and mass transfer, okay? So chapter 10 is forced convection, forced convection, heat and mass transfer in confined flows. So now we have finished the discussion on boundary layers, a drag and so on. So potential flow was not, we had the D-Alembers paradox. Now we have derived, uh, systematically shown how to calculate drag force using scaling analysis and Blasius solution. We briefly discussed the skin drag, form drag. Now we are basically finished with the fluid mechanics part of the course. Essentially we have mostly covered all different types of flows except turbulent flows. Okay? It is beyond this course, but we have covered all different kinds of flows. So if you if you are ever in a fluid mechanics kind of thing of a fluid mechanics problem, one of the approximations we have discussed would apply, like lubrication, creeping flow, boundary layers, and so on. Most of it will fall in that category. The only thing that we haven't covered is turbulence. All right. So with that, now we go towards the part forced convection, heat and mass transfer in confined flows. So this is really the convergence of whatever we have been discussing in the entire course. We will not try to talk about Multi physics problems. Okay, so like there is heat and mass transfer happening while the flow is also happening. Okay, now there are some terminology here. I'm saying forced convection is very important to understand what is this in confined flow. So there are two parts forced convection and confined flows, and I'll discuss both of them just to give an idea. Chapter 11 would be forced convection, heat and mass, mass transfer in unconfined flows. Okay, so we'll make first discuss the confined flows and we'll discuss the unconfined flows. So what is force convection is that velocity impacts heat and mass transfer and heat and mass transfer don't impact velocity. I'll go to the math, but it's important to understand understand the idea. So velocity impacts heat and mass transfer, 
the heat and mass transfer don't impact the law. So, could you, could you think of a physical example where uh, velocity would impact heat and mass transfer? Is this something that you think? Sorry, can you can you? Uh, yeah, cooling fan, right? Like a, like a heating fan, a cooling fan. You know, so that, that's obviously like you you are kind of like using velocity as a way to heat or cool the room. That's obviously uh, 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 an, uh, an option. Uh, anything else that comes to mind? Something maybe more industrial that you kind of think is important? Heat exchangers, right? So I mean, anything pipes like the the flow of pipes. It's like in all this is and sometimes students wonder this a lot that why are we studying flow in pipes it's not like what's the relevance you have to understand that almost last century in engineering was about taking you know heat and energy through pipes right flow of you know gasoline in pipes flow of energy heat in pipes flow of water in pipes so all the all the pipes that you see when you get hot water in your uh, in your you know homes that's basically heat transfer, right? It's the hot water is coming with the flow. So there is a heat transfer problem there. And there is a lot of, you know, engineering principles. There is also heat exchanger. We had discussed a little bit about pin design, but that was without thinking about the, the convection part yet. But I hope you can see like, this is very, very kind of, that's why this is so traditional engineering field. Basically this kind of impacts a lot of things that we take for granted. So this is kind of the theory behind all of that. But more modern things as well now, right? There's a lot of emphasis now in biological transport, where basically the flow is happening and there's mass transport, right? So uh, uh, there is also like lung exchange, right? There is mass transfer in, in inside your lung, which is both flow and mass transfer. So there's also now new emphasis there in the field of catalysis. You may be using convection to speed up reaction rates. Uh, then you have again with that heat and mass transfer. So this is kind of like really culmination of all of transport together. Uh, classical transport, okay? So one thing that I want to em em emphasize in the last part of like few lectures is there is now a new emphasis on another kind of transport that is electrical transport. That is, we'll add sort of some sort of uh, electric field on top of it. And that's sort of like heat mass in electric transport, okay? So we'll discuss that later, but I hope you can see sort of the impact. This, this is the impact. Now, I wanted to think of an example where actually heat and mass transfer impacts velocity. So we've been, we've been thinking that velocity can help or affect in heat and mass transfer. When do you think my heat and mass transfer will impact velocity? Any any thoughts? Strong changes in density. So you know that's basically if you have let's say a very heated floor, right, and you don't have any background flow, then the density of the air will change, and you will have that basically we call called natural convection or you know a, a convection where basically that's happening because of. Uh, you know, not you're not adding any convection, it's just happening in response to changes in density, in response to changes to other physical properties, viscosity, or whatever. But in this point, we will not discuss that. So, this is forced convection that's called natural convection. The book does have that in discussion, we'll just not discuss it. It's, it's, it's again becomes more complicated. We'll focus on more on the things that we have learned. But I want to just emphasize that in case you're working in a system and your research has come across later on in your careers. Force convection is not going to completely cover the entire subject. There's also natural convection bit where essentially heat and mass transfer is actually in that, impacting the product. Okay. All right. So with that, let's now go towards governing equations. Again, we always start with governing equations and then you simplify, right? That's that is the process. So let's look at governing equations. We have already seen them before, but let's just write them down. Governing equations. So we have the continuity equation. Uh, we have the Navier-Stokes equation. And then we also have the, the species transport and the heat equations. So you have seen some of these equations right before. So the first two are the continuity and uh, Navier-Stokes equation. So remember this was constant rho and mu. So we've assumed that 
here we have assumed constant di and pseudo binary. So this is part one now coming back. And then here we have assumed constant k, rho cp, and so on. So physical properties are constant. That's why we can we should not worry much about the natural convection part. If I was forcing the density to change, maybe some other property to change, change. Generally, density is the most common cause. Uh, but uh, other properties, then we may have that, but we will not consider that. Okay. So how do I solve these two equations? Do I need to solve any of the other equations to solve the top two? Do you think I need to solve this equation to solve the top two or? Right. So because in this problem, we are seeing our properties, rho, mu, are independent of temperature and concentration. I can just solve them independently, right? And will I just solve the full equation? Should I solve the full equation or what can I do? This is all of your part two, right? Like you don't have to solve the full equation. Find which approximation is valid, unidirectional, nearly unidirectional or lubrication, creeping flow, creeping flow, potential flow, or boundary layer flow. So you can have all of these systems, potential flow or like, you know, boundary layer flow. And then this will give you a V that goes into the, feeds into your next equation. Right? So basically the, any, so depends, depends on what problem you're solving. Maybe you have a near unidirectional problem, maybe you have a unidirectional problem, and the velocities you will calculate from that and then feed into this next equation. Make sense? Yes. Uh, oh, sorry, constant K, yeah. Constant K, rho and CP. So, yeah. oh yeah, so that's in the alpha. No, this, this is the thermal diffusivity. Remember, alpha is K by rho CP. So this is forced convection heat and mass transfer. Where we can calculate velocity independent of any heat and mass transfer problem. And we have already done that. We have already done how to solve different kinds of problems. We have whether it's unidirectional, new unidirectional, boundary layer flow, and so on. Okay. So you don't, I mean, these equations are there, but please don't use them. Like if you give something like this in a homework exam, you don't have to use those equations. You are you have been told, like, okay, look for the assumption, unidirectional, steady or near you know, lubrication problem, creeping flow, use the equations that are relevant to that particular system, which were derived from this, but like you don't, we don't have to reinvent again, but that was the process. And then we'll go back to the second equation. All right now, so assuming velocity is known. So let's assume velocity is known. So let us assume velocity is known. So we'll basically say, let us assume step one, velocity is known, okay? Now I want you to articulate and think of what do you think? Now, I obviously, if I just know velocity, it's not like I can just simply solve it. In some scenarios we can solve it, but it's still a complicated equation because you have V dot grad T, V dot grad T, it's a three dimensional time dependent equation with partial derivatives. What do you think I should look for? Like I, basically what I'm trying to ask is, how should I simplify my equation to these transport equations in species and mass transfer? What, what, what do you think would be the ratio of different processes that I should try to compare to drop one term or the other? So can you can you can you repeat again? Okay, so so what, what Swarajit is saying is that. We should look for non-dimensional groups like Schmidt number or Prandtl number. But remember, Schmidt number or Prandtl number are the numbers that are properties of that particular fluid. So they can tell you the relative rates between different transport mechanisms, not within a transport mechanism. So a Schmidt number or a Prandtl number may allow me to compare these two, but I cannot compare different terms within the system. Okay. So let me let me let me go back. In the let of the Navier-Stokes equation, what dimensionless group tells you that 
which term to focus on in a in a navier stokes equation reynolds number right so you essentially need a dimensionless group that is analogous to a reynolds number and that's very common so to get confused it's called peclet number okay and just this there is this lack of sort of sort of so remember reynolds number and peclet number essentially the one and the same thing just that one focuses on the fluid mechanical transport one focuses on a species or a thermal transport okay and then prandtl number schmidt number or lewis number those are ratios that can help you compare between the conduct uh, when the diffusive transports of different processes that cannot help you compare within an equation we never drop the offer term in a in a problem by thinking oh well schmidt number is low or prandtl number is low okay so just kind of remember that differentiation in mind those are physical properties of a fluid now we are talk, talking of a flow physical properties of a flow flow is fast reynolds number is high okay so let's define a peclet number so peclet number can be defined it's used for both so this is called peclet number peclet number is uh, defined for both heat and mass so for heat for mass this tool for mass you can think of it like this um, u times c dc time by l or this becomes u l by d this is convective flux and this is diffusive flux okay so this is for peclet for mass mass transport and then i have peclet for heat transport and this is very important rho cpt u this is my rho cpt yes yes julia oh c is the concentration c c i some sort of a concentration c yeah sorry i forgot to mention it this is some concentration of species so right dc a d grad c right dc by l is kind of like a diffusive flux d grad c right we had we had discussed this in part 1 and then velocity times c is sort of like the convective transfer so this is a scale similarly rho cpt u is that and then we have k um, kt by l here k grad t was a diffusive diffusive one and t gets cancelled and obviously you will get u l by alpha which is peclet for thermal transport right so whenever we think of a reynolds number for fluid mechanics now i want you to think okay peclet number is the same for me in the mass transport and heat transport this is a very common question that i often ask students in preliminary exam because they have a flow and like a diffusion what's the ratio and the answer is just many times students say reynolds number but that's only for fluid mechanics this is kind of like a reynolds number for a heat and mass transport right let's remember that peclet number kind of is analog as for that and you can see it depends on the velocity so if you increase the velocity it goes up it increases it's very similar right so uh, by the way don't remember that reynolds number can be also thought of as rho u l by mu or u l by nu right doesn't it look very similar right u l by nu it's a momentum diffusivity there and it is u l by d and u l by alpha so it's kind of like a very similar definition also right so that's why it's kind of reynolds number for uh, so so basically then so velocity is known if you know the velocity you can find a, a representative peclet number now what if the peclet number is small what should i do yeah diffusion dominates so and you know how to solve all of that part 1 right if peclet number is small or much smaller than 1 that's just part or less than less than one that's your part one of the course that's basically basically just solve conduction diffusion reaction generation kind of problems don't forget we discuss things like their similarity you know we also discussed you know pseudo study pseudo study similarity perturbation and obviously the most important of them fft 
we can kind of solve all of those problems. We know how we have discussed how to do them. So the second number is small. I really like velocity is just not important. Diffusion dominates, then there is not not like force convection is not interesting because convection is not really important, right? So really, the regime we are interested in is vector number is large. Okay, so that I hope you can see the process. So the regime we are really interested in is Peclé number is large. This is part three of the course. And this is what we'll discuss today. Okay. Any questions in the process? Uh, uh, yes, please. Um, when we start by finding the velocity, mm -hmm. um, now it's so right? Right. You have a Reynolds number down there. Is it related to the number? Great question. So it is related, but it's not the same because the denominator, remember that the denominator is going to be different, right? So let, let me give an example. So let's say you have a, a laminar slope, right? Or something like that in your system and your Peclé number is, you got a Reynolds number, let's say 100, right? But if I'm trying to get from Reynolds number to Peclé number, I don't need to divide by nu, I need to divide by D. So so let's say this number is 100. So example, okay. So let's say example, Reynolds number is 100. What will be the mass Peclé number? That will be UL by D. And that is UL by nu times nu by D. Do you agree? And so this is 100 times nu by D. And what is nu, what is nu by D? That's the Schmidt number. That's the, that's the property of the fluid. And that we had discussed is very large. So if Reynolds number is 100, your Peclé number can still be very large. So like and Reynolds number 100 is let's say in a pi flow is considered to be a laminar flow or a small, like not that high of a Reynolds number, but Peclé number can be huge in those problems still. So that's why like this, even in like, uh, like you know, the, the convection becomes really important for heat and mass transport much earlier because this new body Schmidt number generally, you know, can be quite, quite high, high right? Make sense? Any questions here? So that's how you, that's how uh, Sophie, the, the Reynolds number and Petri number are related They're through the physical properties. All right, so now uh, we are focusing on this problem. Uh, I really, so this this pro this topic is a broad topic of like, you know, post convection. I want to focus on one model problem that I think kind of takes care of all the different effects and really go into the depth of that. And this problem which we'll do today is similar to the one that you will do in your homework, which is homework five, problem two. That problem will be on the mass transport. This is on heat transport. So you'll see both flavors uh, and you'll kind of, I can walk you through the entire process and, you know, kind of set it up to make sure that you can solve the problem. Okay. So that's that. that let's, let's discuss the problem. So the problem is really uh, that we have a pipe and we were discussing this before we you know, even started. We have a pipe and which has a fully developed flow. So it is steady. Um, by the way, I forget the uh, example number in the book, but this is called the Grates problem. Um, Grates problem. So like Blasher solution, this is the Grates solution. Okay. So steady, fully developed flow, fully developed unidirectional flow. This has been given to you, okay? So this is sort of an assumption that, and no gravity either, no gravity. Okay. Some flow is coming in. This The fluid that is coming in is at the temperature of T is equal to T naught. Okay, so some temperature T is equal to T naught is coming in. And um, this radius is R. This velocity, average velocity is U. Average velocity is U. And the temperature of this pipe is TW, T wall, some temperature TW. And you're heating the pipe in a way, right? So, so the fluid coming in, it comes in, it's at some temperature T naught, and then the pipe is heated. Um, and we have been given that we'll define Peclé number as 2UR by alpha, so because alpha, remember, is a thermal diffusivity, and we have been given that this is much, much greater than 1. 
So any questions first here? Any questions that are, are confusing? Anything that, that, that needs clarification right now? Yeah, it's a long pipe. So by the way, just it's also clear it's a long pipe. So this length L. So it's very common assumption. It's very also very true. You know from the pipes in your apartment or home that R by L like the radius is very thin pipe, so long pipes. So R by L is very small. All right, so the question really is how much heat I am putting in to the fluid, right? And for that, uh, basically, we want to think of finding a way to understand how much, how much heat we are putting into the system. So I, I will discuss in a bit, but physically, physically, like I hope you can see that the, the heating would, would vary spatially, right? So if this is R, if this is R and this is Z, I hope you can see that initially, as soon as the cold water hits the hot pipe, the heat transfer will vary, right, spatially. And that's what you want to solve. So first, the first appreciation is, okay, we understand this, but the heat transfer will, uh, will be problems, okay? So in these problems, the first step, first step is to solve fluid flow. To solve fluid flow. What do you think is the velocity profile here? Do we know the velocity profile? Sorry? Absolutely, yeah. You already derived this in one of your homework problems, right? It's a flow through a pipe. So we know the velocity profile, and for an average velocity of u is only a function of r. It's steady to fully developed. V is a V is a function of r, u1 minus r by r whole square. So remember, I'm I'm skipping the step. The governing equation obviously would be, you know, dp by dz is equal to mu by r del by del r, r del vz by del r. And you all of you did this, you know, you did this and come to this problem. This was your homework four, problem one, I believe. I believe that was that is correct. Homework four, problem one. You kind of did this and you came at this solution. So we already know the fluid flow. In your home, in your in your homework problem, you solved the velocity profile in a falling film, which was one of your exam problems. So, so you will also have that the result. And but we just asked you to do the steps so that you can remember that this is how you solve the fluid flow. So we solve the fluid flow, the step. Okay. All right. Now, second, we go for the get the heat and mass problem. So, so we basically now write 2.1 is governing equation for uh, heat and mass transfers. In this case, it's just heat transfer. All right. So heat transfer, we know it is um, del T by del T plus uh, V dot del T plus H V by rho C P. Okay. So we have this as the the uh, V vector here. V dot del T. Okay. So uh, let's before even going further, what what terms can I draw in terms of like other assumptions given? Is there any heat being generated within the system? No, right? No reaction or anything like that. So we can get rid of this. Then steady. So I can get rid of this as well. So V dot del T is equal to alpha del square T. All right. So, and if you can put the, remember that velocity is only VZ EZ. So it's not very difficult to see that VZ times del T by del Z becomes equal to alpha del square T by, um, not del square T, 1 by R. del by del r of r del t by del r plus del square t by del z square. Okay, so first fluid velocity, fluid velocity impacts the heat and mass transfer or heat transfer in this case, so we can go to this problem, we drop up the term and we get to this one. Okay. Before proceeding further, let's also discuss what are the boundary conditions. Anybody wants to suggest any boundary conditions here? Anything are important? 
so so jason had that were you guessing the same things okay so basically <laughs> let's first how many boundary conditions we need in r and z there is a double derivative in r there is a double derivative in z because of four boundary conditions absolutely correct right four boundary conditions so first in z so at z equal to zero which is the entry point so r comma zero we know its temperature is t naught at this wall, some which which was just mentioned, I think was R comma Z is T wall. But how do I get the other two boundary conditions? I need four. Anything else I know the system? Sorry, symmetry, right? So cylindrical pipes. Remember that the derivatives have to vanish at the center. We have discussed this. So delta by del R at R equal to zero is zero. What else? What else do you think? Is there anything else? Or have you done? Yeah, so that's the that's the, the boundary condition most students kind of uh, sometimes forget is that remember that dt by dz as as z is going to infinity is going to approach zero. Right? The temperature will stop varying really far away. Will not necessarily set the wall temperature. I'm not doing that on purpose. It can come out to be that way anyway. But this is let's say more mathematically accurate. Okay. And by the way, I have solved these differential equations my, myself, like numerically coding it. And you, it's very you can do it. And then this boundary condition gives you the most sensible results. And it's it's, it's nice to solve this. Okay. So you get this problem. Obviously, we. We don't want to solve the full problem because we have been given some things. We have been given Peclet number is large, right? We have been given Peclet number is large, aspect ratio is small. So I, I have a question for all of you, and we will take a break after that. If Peclet number is large, do you think I can drop off some term? And which term do you think I should drop off? Mm -hmm. So I, I see some, yeah. So I see basically if Peclet number is large, I should just drop off the right term, right? I should just say. If Peclet is large, then should I just say Vz delta by delta Z is zero, zero? Yeah, so, so I'm skipping some of the steps, but you can scale it and you will get that, that here. Like you'll get a Peclet number and you'll, you'll get to that, that, that'll come out. But let's imagine for a second you have scaled it and done that. Then do you think this is this is correct? What's what's the problem? So so V Z is not zero, so I just get del T by del Z is zero. So that means temperature is constant. Any any problem? What's what's going on? So I wanted to think about it and let's discuss the result after uh, let's discuss the answer after the break. Okay, so let's take a five minute break. Just discuss amongst yourself what do you think would be going on. And a small hint is think about boundary conditions while you're also thinking about this. Okay, so we'll come back, start to discuss this, but you're thinking around the right direction. So 1253, let's begin again. Okay, so let's 1253, we'll come back.
So we only have the last one from you on the gate of because for reason I will be going. Yes, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm talking about that. I'll just watch the stuff online. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's actually it works out really nicely because I will only have kinetic stuff. I see, <laughs> and not really much other stuff too, so it'll work. Out. Fine, that's good. Yeah, that's fine. I'm glad you're able to go. Yeah, I'm excited. It's gonna be really cool. I definitely in the lab. I definitely want to start getting towards like some fluid stuff of course actually. yeah absolutely um, because that's cool to me yeah <laughs> no yeah we should so, we should chat it um, yeah so you want to semester is over basically yeah i need to figure out exactly what yeah. stuff yeah it's like how many projects i have time for and stuff like that so yeah absolutely no i have always happy to chat cool yeah. all right let's start um any 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 answers? Anybody wants to take a guess of what's going on here? <laughs> so uh, I think you are going. Some of you are going in the right direction. So this is T T naught. So I think maybe at the end there is T naught. So what it's saying is that if my boundary layer, sorry, what is the answer? But if my convection is so fast. Then I will not have any time to heat it up, right? So this is the solution, right? Let's say you have infinite velocity. You just you're just going zooming through the pipe, and it doesn't have any time to heat up, which is a fair answer. But what does it miss? It misses something. What is the miss? The miss is that we are not satisfying these two boundary conditions, which is I think what uh, I think. Uh, Rajesh was saying, and also what Tim was saying was that there is some kind of a radial component there that we are we are not we are not satisfying those boundary conditions, right? So, and what happens if they just ring a bell? This is similar to not being able to satisfy a no slip in your fluid mechanics problem. You are not able to satisfy the surface condition of the wall being at the temperature of P wall, and that's why there is now a thermal boundary there in the system. And that's why that is that's why the solution is incomplete. Okay, so what will happen in the system is that you start here, you start here like this, and then initially this region will have temperature equal to T naught. 
So the solution isn't wrong, just that near the wall, because near the wall, the fluid will heat up. There will be some gradient and slowly all of this will merge and you will get the fully developed profile here. This region is called a developing region. And this is called the developed region. In the developing region, we have this distance will be delta t of some function z. Remember, this is z, this is r. And we are saying delta t by r is much, much smaller than 1. Right? Delta t by r is better. And what's happening once we have gone to the developed region? At that point, the temperature profile has fully developed and we have on the order of one. Okay. It's sort of similar to each other. Any questions, sir? Yes, please. Yeah, so good question. So the the the, the what, what Sophie is asking actually is a very deep question is what about the velocity? So the velocity is as you know that we'll discuss it by the way later. The velocity we have already assumed to be fully developed. And we'll discuss this later on, uh, like maybe next Friday when we have the makeup lecture, is that the velocity can also be developing. So we'll have a developing temperature profile and a developing velocity profile. Right now, for simplicity, we've ignored that development of velocity profile. So that's an assumption. And I'll justify that assumption when we when we go to that part. Yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so that's correct. Like if I have a differently long pipe, that's true. But uh, there's some small subtle like, uh, Differences there that we generally obviously don't go through an infinite pipe for a fine length pipe. There's a very small gradient that uh, does happen, but there is something one feature which which we will define develop developed region by. So I'll mention that in a bit and I'll clarify some of the questions. Yes, please. So in this, uh, are we dealing with the temperature profile? Yes, please. Yes, please. Correct. So great question. So this is a great question. Is that when we say fully developed, I should really be saying fully developed for flow only. So that's correct. That was implicit in my statement, but that is basically, it's only true meaning true for flow in right now. Okay. And this is developing. All right. Yes. Yes. No question. Yes. Okay, part of one. So this is the temperature profile. Uh, sorry. This is just my habit of writing more. This is basically, I'm saying that this is one. Almost comparable to each other. Yes. And yes. Yes. No. So, 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 what you're asking, just to give you an answer before, is that the momentum boundary gates are always much thicker than the thermal and the, uh, the, the mass boundary layer. And that's why they develop much faster. So, they are developing, but they will be developed much faster. So, that's why they're growing that region. And I'll explain why that happens a uh, little bit later. Don't worry about it now. But imagine that between this pipe, there was a small region, like small region, if you really want to zoom in here, where like the, the boundary layer for the momentum has already developed. That, that is basically a property that momentum boundary layers develop much faster. Yes. Sorry. So in the developed region, it doesn't mean that the temperature is the temperature of wall. No, it doesn't. So it doesn't. So that's a great question. It doesn't mean that. It all it means basically is that that we will have the temperature profile not changing. Um, and specifically, what happens is there's something called Nusselt number that I defined. That doesn't change in that region. It is kind of we want to think that delta by delta is zero. That we think the temperature will stop changing in the z direction. But that is not the definition for the temperature for the region. Fully developed region is not characterized by that because if I say delta by delta z is zero, as you can imagine, that means there is no convective heat anyways. So if I if I drop the left hand side completely, 
then there is no convection of heat anyway. So it can be small, but it's just not zero. That, that's that's that small difference. So I'll explain that in a, in, a, in when I solve a little bit. Yes, no. Is the is done Correct. So that is the common layer for the fluid flow. Right. Then the developed region that was the region part that was some more that was the region. No, we're starting for both regions. So the, so the point is now we are saying that so imagine that if there was no flow, I right? was just a heated pipe, you know how to solve any convection. Now we have added the flow. The flow part we have said is fully developed, so they're not going from the boundary layer from the fluid part, right? We'll get to that next week, but right now we're saying flow is fully developed. So we want to understand how fully developed or how that impacts the heating of the pump. And within that heat problem, heat transfer problem, there are two reasons. One, because of the high tech number where I don't satisfy the boundary condition. Where I don't satisfy the boundary condition. Like if I do that, that means I need to have a boundary layer where I can satisfy the boundary condition. And then the region where the, I can satisfy all the boundary conditions, but I have developed the temperature profile through boundary. So that comes out of my governing conditions, not something that I have from these governing conditions. Yeah. So this is sort of not related to the momentum boundary layer yet. Yeah. Yeah. We have to For a thermal part, yes, absolutely. So you'll be able to obviously like similar to boundary layer, you'll be solving using similarity. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, it's yeah. Just as a boundary as a boundary layer, if you were looking at the heating of the surface that's not moving from the fluid. Like now we're looking at how the fluid uh, right. changes temperature, but if we're looking at like how the surface changes temperature with like capacity fluid, would those kind of things? Yes, yes, absolutely. So if you I think what Sophie is asking, just to clarify, Sophie. You are saying if this is a heated heated surface, let's say, and I'm just just flowing some air here. Then will there be a boundary? Is that the question? Okay. Oh, so interesting question. So, uh, but what is what is heated? Is the is the the bulk fluid heated, or like I mean something has to be higher temperature? Yeah, so the, the, the hot hotter one. And yeah, and you're trying to keep the, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that I mean that's a reverse problem saying I'm pulling the fluid in a way. So you can basically say it's the same problem where I'm saying now my T wall is actually lower than T naught. It'll still change this, the profiles will be reversed. So there'll be boundary layers still there. Absolutely. Make sense? Any other questions? Great questions, by the way. Any other questions here? Yeah, so basically at each problem, if you have three transports, you can have a concentration boundary layer, a thermal boundary layer, and a momentum boundary layer. And then there is also a sub-momentum boundary layer. So these are all like, you know, really kind of uh, good, good questions. But we'll discuss a little bit next time. Unfortunately, we'll not be able to discuss like the full depth of all the different boundary layers. But yeah, great questions. Any other questions here before I move on? All good? Okay, so now, let's now quickly do the, quickly do the governing equations in governing equations in in developing developing region and governing equations in in developed region So uh, I'll be a little, uh, I'll just try to uh, do this a bit fast, just so that, but I want to make sure you're seeing the process. So could, could anyone suggest, what do you think, um, which term of them can I drop and why? Can I drop any of the terms in the developing region here? Yes. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So we can drop this term 
Why? Because you know it's a long pipe, right? You know it's a long pipe, and the radial distance at the delta r. Remember that delta r in this problem is simply delta t, where delta z is actually on the order of the uh, the length of the pipe, or if you want, radius of the pipe, right? So basically, we will drop this term off, and we will get v z delta by delta z is equal to alpha by r. Any questions here first for the developing region? Now I want to simplify it further. How do you think I can simplify it further? Remember now we are thinking of something in this region. We know the region outside is T naught. That was Tim's question. We know the outside value is simply T naught. So in outer region, we don't have to solve. We know the value is T naught. How do I solve? How do I further simplify this region? What do you think is the way to do it? So the idea is that now we, so the way we have defined our coordinate system is Z and R. Would you agree? Sorry, R and Z. So Z and R here. And what it does not give me the ability to do is it does not allow me to go to the surface of the pipe, right? So I should define a Y which is R minus R, okay, R minus R. Does it make sense? R minus R and basically what I will get is VZ del T by del Z is equal to alpha small r is R minus Y del by del Y of And can anybody suggest what should I think about this term? Can I approximate R minus Y at all? So, uh, so I think, I think let, let me let me let me make sure everybody is following here. So here, remember we are delta T here, right? Okay, delta T by R is more than one. Do you agree that this delta T is basically R minus y by r in a way sorry uh, not r minus y it's actually r minus r in a way so if i am standing here right then this is r minus r by capital r is much much more than one right or in a way y by r is much much more than one so in an effect i can essentially make this to be r this to be r or this implies that vz del t by del z becomes alpha del square t by del y square okay so i want to emphasize physically if this is a bit confusing i understand this is a lot of like the chain coordinates and also dropping down and this is side to side but think of it like this that okay let's let's think of it like this think think that this basically here, this is the pipe, okay? So we are kind of heating the pipe from here. There's a very thin boundary layer developing here. So very thin boundary layer. When I'm looking, I'm sitting here, I don't see the center of the pipe. I don't think it's a pipe at all. I will just think something is like, let's say the pipe is this large, and I'm just going somewhere here. And for me, it's like a planar problem. That's why you get simply like a del square t by del y. So I've kind of forgotten the curvature of it because I'm so close to the wall that I don't think of the, the center of the pipe. Does it make sense? So I'm very far like in the system. So we get this. And there's one small part here as well. So Vz is 2u1 minus r by r whole square. And this is equal to 2u1 minus r minus y whole square by r square. And if you will do this problem and you will find this will become 2u y by r. Or so actually 4u y by r, my mistake. You'll get 4u y by r. You can simplify this a little bit, but you can simply you will take the r square on the other side, find the r minus y square, then you will drop the y square, because y square will be smaller, and you will get 4u y by r. 
can anybody can could could anybody explain yes please yes 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 why is basically so think of why like this so this is why is this going on the surface could could somebody explain this result why why do I get a result like this? Can you just tell me an idea? Why do I get you four four times each and why by far? Like why is it better? So first there is no slip, so at y equal to zero, the last is zero. This makes sense. The other part is linear. Why? Because whenever any profile, if you're close to the surface, all the profiles look like a linear profile, right? This is the common. So all the, the parabolic program looks like a linear surprise, but only close to the surface. That's something you might have read before. So essentially that also confirms that this is what you get. So finally, essentially what you get out is you get 4uy by r. Four U Y by R del T by del Z is equal to alpha del square T by del Y square. And this is my developing equation. Okay. For t equal to y comma z equal to zero, it's t naught. T equal to um, y equal to zero comma z. We know it's t wall. And we know and note this is important at r comma. Uh, Z, this will be T naught. So in the center of the channel, center will get to be T naught. So this is the assumption of the boundary. So this was Tim's question. How do I stitch this with the outer solution when I'm looking at this? So I have to solve this problem for the developing region. Okay, and I'll discuss a little bit about this in a second, but, but this, is, this, is this clear to everyone? First, any questions here? Yes. I can say that Oh yeah, so so I think what what basically um, so it's a good question. Um, so there's a small detail here that I will kind of not explain is that. Here, if you expand, so it's a good question. So, what what uh, what is being asked is this. So, what you're saying is, I'm saying this is one minus y by r. So you can ignore this, right? This is what I'm saying. So note here, it is one minus, and you can take the r square outside. It is one minus y by r whole square, right? So if I ignore the full term, this will become zero. So velocity obviously is not zero entirely. So you start to expand it to be more accurate. So when you expand it, you write this as one plus y by r whole square plus two y by r. And so this y by r, this one will get canceled and then you will take this as dominating because y by r is, doesn't make sense. So that's how I kind of skipped some of the steps. You will do this in a homework also a little bit. So you'll get some practice to that. Uh, any questions for the developing equation? All good. All right. For the depth, yeah. Uh, question, Colin. Yes. Yeah. So just the last boundary condition. Yeah. Um. So at the outer wall, mm -hmm. it's equal to T naught. Um. At the center. Yeah. Okay. Because y is r minus of so I'm looking from the wall to the center, right? So now my y equal to zero is the wall, and center is y equal to capital R. Make sense? So for the developed region, I will also give you equations. So for the developed region, essentially what you get is, it's not, it's the same, basically you drop off the Delta Z, but you don't, you cannot simplify this further. You just say to you, R by R whole square, Del T by Del Z is equal to alpha, Del by Del R, R, Del T by Del R. And then you have a similar sort of equation. You will say now at r equal to zero comma z, 
So number, remember, I'm not changing the variables for the developed region. I'm saying del T by del R at R equal to zero is zero. T at R comma Z is T wall. And here, uh, and I'll explain this result in a second. You kind of say that I'll still assume that the temp, I'm, I'm kind of forgetting the developing region now to close this known equation and I'm only looking at the initial value because I've dropped a derivative, right? I've dropped one derivative from a second. So I just have one boundary condition in Z. Developed region you will not solve, neither in your homework nor here, basically, but you know, this is a linear equation. I hope all of you can see this is a linear equation and you can solve using FFT, okay? But it's a much more complex solution and uh, I have also never done this myself. I have just used a numerical code after this, but you can solve it, yes, so please. So, it's not zero, so that's the one part that's kind of confusing sometimes with the print. It's not zero, and explain what is different. Here is the convection in the radial direction balancing in the, with the conduction. It's also true there, but the difference is that now the, the, the balance is throughout the profile. And note one difference, key difference. Here, the temperature at the center is T naught. Here, the temperature at the center, I don't know. So there's a, there's a difference. So it's a balance of the radial, radial conduction with the axial convection and both cases, but this is only near the wall and this is throughout the region with another caveat that I don't know the temperature at the center. Here I know this has to be T naught because I'm so thin close to the wall that I cannot have any other temperature. So that's a difference between the two. Make sense? Okay. So we are running out of time. So I just want to focus on one thing. And then I'll mention what you kind of need to do for your homework, which is not very difficult, but let's just mention, I want to mention one thing. So in your homework, you will derive these equations to this point, and then you will solve just this equation, okay? So let me first go through one thing. Now, I want to think about the scaling analysis of this problem, okay? Scaling analysis. So scaling analysis, I hope you will all agree that delta Y is similar to delta T, right? Delta Y is similar to delta T. And what you will basically uh, and what else we, we will get out is delta t is simply t wall minus t naught delta z is similar to z and if you ex if, if expand all of that you get out delta t to be so i don't give you the wrong result let me just make sure you get delta t out to be alpha z r by u you get this to be the case, okay? So first thing first, it's the power is one third. Remember the power was one half for your, uh, for the, the momentum model here. Thermal boundary there has one third. Why is this one third? Because of the velocity profile also is now has a Y, right? Velocity profile also has a Y and that's then Y will also bring out a delta T. So that becomes the one third in your homework problem. The velocity profile does not have a y. So you actually get out of one half. It's kind of interesting that in heat and mass transfer, you can have either of one third, one half. And we'll discuss more next time in Friday, next Friday. But basically, first, it's one third here. Second thing is if you write this to be alpha t by r, what essentially you get out is you get out to be ur by alpha, one third, and then you get out a z by r one third and this is make, make, making sure it is peculiar to the power of minus one third uh, one third okay does this make sense so you can just rearrange this and does this remind you of anything this is similar to your moment of order where you had a Reynolds number when you were thinking of delta t by l or delta t delta by x right and here it's here it's peculiar number but it's a one third power law one third power law. That's first thing. And whenever you see something like this, what do you have to do? Is you have to use similarity to solve. So what do you basically do in this problem? Is you define theta to be t minus t naught by t wall minus t naught, and make it a function of eta, where eta is y by alpha z r or one third.
make sense any questions here first all right so we have gone through a lot so just give me one minute and i know and so i'm running out of time just just want to explain one thing so that you if you're trying to do your homework problem you can i hope you can see that here we know the delta t will be similar to r right so it's sim simply delta t by r is one right that's simple so on the left hand side you do all of this right hand side simply it's we know that the fully developed region right so the full the the, the temperature gradients are throughout so it's on the order of one now what happens essentially is that why is this all of this interesting is that people typically define something called the Nussel's number, which is called the, uh, so sometimes I forget myself the definition. So it's the call is 2HR by K, where H times TW minus T naught is K del T by del R at R equal to capital R. Okay, so just bear with me. I, I, I realize this is a little last minute, but I just want to explain one thing. Uh, dr this and so this becomes if you substitute this back here substitute this actually becomes del t by del r double r by t wall minus t naught uh, and then there is an uh, two r here okay so you can just substitute this you get this the reason i wanted to do this was what do you think is delta t? If I want to scale Nusselt's number, what do you think will be delta t? I hope you will all agree. This is t wall minus t naught, right? And delta r would be delta t, thermal boundary length, right? So your Nusselt's number is actually r by delta t. And in the developing region, we have found delta T by R. So remember, I have already found this here, right? So if you solve it, you get Peclé number to the R by delta T is simply Peclé number to the power one third, R by Z to the power one third. And in this problem, this was Sophie's question long back was, what is the, what is the developing region definition and that is the Nusselt's number becomes constant. So that is a mathematical definition instead of using a gradient is that your Nusselt's number becomes constant and the scaling analysis gives you this result. If you solve the full problem, you get the coefficient here to be 1.357. Here you get the coefficient 4.4 if you solve the full problem. I just wanted to kind of emphasize that the whole goal of this exercise generally is to find a temperature profile to calculate this Nusselt's number which is basically trying to just compare the, the total con, total uh, transfer rate with respect to the uh, with respect to the, con, uh, uh, the conduction mode. The loving region, because the, 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 the bond rate is very thin, you get a very high transfer rate. Because the larger the pattern number, the higher this number is. But when you go to the developed region, the conduction and convection balance completely each other each other out throughout the pore, throughout throughout the cylinder. So you simply get a constant number. So I will elaborate on this again. I just wanted to mention this because you will do this in your homework problem as well. If you want to start, you can start that and essentially there will be simply square root number, which is the analog for the mass transfer. And you will get very similar scales. Just that remember you will have half there. If you have one third, you can find it wide as half. We will discuss it in the next lecture as well. Okay, just wanted to emphasize that. So that's it for today. Uh, no lectures on Monday and Wednesday. We'll do a makeup lecture on Friday. I'll send out the Zoom Zoom link for that. Uh, and then, you know, if, if any questions in the meantime, please do not hesitate to email us. Philippe will have office hours this Friday and the next Friday. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, sorry for going over time. Over there. Sorry. Yeah. Step below the R.